your run. I'll just put my, I'll put my many goggles on my head here. Good evening. How's everybody's week going so far? See a lot of somber looking faces out there. A couple of smiles, that's better. But we're going to dig back into 2 Timothy here this evening. Uh, very brief review. We see the flow of Timothy going where Paul commands Timothy to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. When times are tough, don't look inward. We've got to look upward. And then in verse, chapter 2, verse 15, he tells us to be diligent to present ourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be shamed. So we need to give maximum effort at all times when we're serving God to the point of exhaustion. And then in 221, we're told to be useful to the master. We have to be willing, ready, and prepared. Now in verse 20, he talks about a great house, which once again means all of us who are genuine believers in Jesus Christ throughout the world. And then the vessels of honor, gold and silver, are believers who are faithful and useful to God. Those of dishonor, the wooden clay, are defiled believers who are not very useful for God's purposes. Um, then Paul begins to give us the how. How can I be a vessel of gold or silver? Silver. How can I be that faithful and useful vessel? Cleanse ourselves from the vessels of dishonor was the first point that he gives us in verse number 21. It says, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, that latter was talking about the vessels of clay and wood, those that are defiled. So that's the first thing that we need to be looking towards, is cleansing ourselves from those dishonorable vessels, those believers who are living a vile lifestyle, who are living a life of sin and not showing the type of remorse that they should. They can be like a cancer to us. Impure lives are something that will have more of a tendency to affect us than the vice versa of us having an effect on them. That's why we're told by Paul that we need not to spend the majority of our time with these believers. Yes, try to reach out. Yes, try to bring them back into the fold. Yes, correct them in love. But not to have those be your closest that you are in fellowship with. Because their lifestyles are more than likely going to have a negative effect on yours instead of the way it should go. Then at the end of the verse 21, he says that those who, that the, he says that those honorable vessels are sanctified and useful to the master. Sanctified and useful to the master. So a vessel of, a vessel of honor is sancti a sanctified soul. The word there is hagiazo, and the basic meaning is set apart. Most of you probably already know that. Now, a Christian is sanctified or set apart in two different ways. First, they are set apart from sin, meaning we should be different from the world. I think it was last week where I kind of left with the question, you know, when you walk out of these doors and get back into your daily lives, are you a different person out there than you are in here? If you are, that's a problem. We need to be consistent. Our testimony needs to be pure. Our testimony needs to be constant, that we're not a different person out there. We don't use different language out there. We don't watch different things out there. We don't listen to different things out there than we would in the house of the God, the house of God. It's just, it's vitally important that we realize God's with us no matter where we go. So the only one you're fooling is yourself. You might pull the wool over the eyes of us in here in this auditorium on occasion. We might think, oh yeah, that, that, that brother's really living to... Uh, good life for Christ, serving him. But if you're out in the world, elbow to elbow with sin, that's a real problem in the eyes of God. Uh, so we got to be cautious with that. We have to make a decision. Do we want to be that honorable vessel or do we want to be the toilet? Yeah, that's kind of the choice. That's what the wooden clay vessel, the vessel of dishonor, vile, vile waste. It's not a pleasant place to be in as, as a believer. The second way that we're set apart from God, or set apart, is we are set apart for God and his righteousness. Now, if you're a vessel of honor, you are now ready to be useful. 
That comes before the fact where he's telling us, serving, it's telling us that um, a sanctified and useful to the master prepared for every good work. We have to be that honorable vessel to be useful for God in a good way. So just as the vessels for the tabernacle and the temple were set apart from all mundane uses and dedicated solely to God and his service, so are those believers who are vessels of honor in the church. Our supreme purpose as a Christian is first and foremost to serve God, and for that we must keep ourselves pure. Do you, want, do you have a desire to serve God? That's the first question to ask yourself. Do I have a desire to serve God? If you're a believer, you should, because we have to realize what he's done for us. Great, great gift of salvation that he has offered to us. It is only right that we should give our lives back to him in service and keep our lives pure from the things of the world. It'd be inconceivable that a vessel could alternate between being useful for vile waste and for the Lord's quests. And that, again, is why I brought up the question. When you walk out these doors, are you a different person? Are you pretending to be a gold or a silver vessel here in church, and when you walk out the door, you're clay or wood? It's something to think about, something to ponder, because we can't vacillate between the two. We can't, we can't be pleasing God by just walking in here and putting on a show for an hour every Sunday and an hour every Wednesday night. It has to be consistent. Our lives have to be completely given over to God for our service. So sanctified in this verse indicates a condition that already exists. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Give you a moment to get there. says there but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you brethren beloved by the Lord because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification being set apart by the spirit and a belief in truth so you've been chosen by God and set apart for God's work by his Holy Spirit that's a pretty hefty calling do you take it seriously do you realize the responsibility that you have as a believer to serve our loving and great God? That's what we've been set apart for. So give it some thought. Now, every believer has been chosen by God. And salvation itself is a sanctification process where we are set apart to God. But it's also the beginning of a lifelong process. Not only have we been sanctified at point of salvation, but we are continually being sanctified throughout our Christian lives, growing as, we, as one fulfills the, the, God's purposes and righteous living. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7 real quickly here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. says, for this is the will of God. Do you ever hear somebody, believers say, I just don't know what God's will for my life is? Well, they're not reading their Bible because it's throughout the Bible what God's will for your life is. Here's one that's pretty hefty for us. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. There's kind of a litmus test outside of, I mean, ultimately I use the Bible. For decisions on, on what I should and should not do as a believer, as a servant of God. And there's a lot of things going on in churches today that 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago would have been unheard of as acceptable within the church. I can remember an instance early on in our marriage. Uh, most of you know I love to cook. And there were several recipes that we made that had wine in them. 
and I would use cooking wine, and it would add some flavor. Uh, no, I would not use cooking wine, I'm sorry. I used regular wine, and it would add flavor to the dish. And one day, I was going into Dominic's to get a bottle of wine to cook with, and all of a sudden, just this, this almost terror came over me. It, was, it had to be God's spirit, just letting me know. What if somebody sees me buying this bottle of wine and then they come here as a visitor at church or they're a member of this church and here's Ron the deacon buying a bottle of hooch at the Dominic's? What's that going to do to my testimony? Now, there could be discussion on whether or not a believer should drink alcohol at all. I, I'm, I'm on the side of no. And I'm, we're not going to get into that tonight. And one of the big points is that exact purpose. When we are sanctified, set apart by the Spirit of God to be different from the world, we got to be really cautious with what activities we partake in if we want to keep our testimony pure. So it's vitally important that you think about these things. And, and I would, I've had this discussion with many people through the years about certain activities. And I would say, you know what? You, you do as you choose. You do as you feel the Spirit is leading you. But if I'm going to err... On an issue like that, I want to err on the side of holiness. Where if I'm abstaining from alcohol altogether, I know God's happy with that. But can I say that God's going to be okay with me having a couple of drinks a night and going to a bar to, to witness to my buddies over a beer? I, I have problems with that. So that's something that you've got to decide for yourself. Study the scriptures. There's, there's some good books out there on alcohol and the believer. Um, it's not coming to the tip of my tongue right now. I might think of it, uh, but I can let you know it's one that I read that was really insightful. It, uh, it opened my mind even more to what the Scripture has to say about alcohol use in the believer. So be cautious. And that's not the only situation, of course. We see the acceptance of all kinds of sin within the church as they're getting closer and closer to the world. I've, I've oftentimes in my classes used a bar graph to, to kind of explain it, you know, how the believers are from here to here to God, but, you know, the world's out here, so we're still this far from the world. And as the world gets more and more evil, we're still saying we're this far from the world. But where are we going in relationship to God? We're getting farther away from Him and honoring Him and glorifying Him with our lives. It's important stuff as a believer. Now, most of you here on Wednesday nights, you're, you're into the meat. You're the faithful. You're, you want to learn. You want to know. You want to have an understanding of what God has for your life. So these are some things to ponder and chew on this evening as we, as we continue on in 2 Timothy. It's just such an important section of Scripture talking about purity in our lives and being useful to God. I, don't, I, I, I would venture to say that anybody in here tonight as a born-again believer would not want to have the moniker of, he's pretty useless. That's a pitiful position to be at. You're a child of God, but you're useless to him. And I, there's not a whole lot of middle ground there. You're useful or you're useless. Now, you might want to say that being useful is, well, you know, I, I show up, I, I'll help out cleaning, I'll come to a work day, I'll do this, I'll do that. Is that the kind of usefulness that God's talking about? Not necessarily. Are those things that we as believers and members of this church should be taking part in when we can? Absolutely. But our usefulness is to be obedient to God and to carry out His will, His righteousness, in His way. So, let's continue on here. The sanctified life is a life of purity, holiness, and godliness. A vessel of honor, worthy for the Lord to use. Now, honorable vessels are separated from sin, from the world, from the flesh, from Satan, and from the self-will of the old self. These are things that we have to be separated from at all times. Not just picking and choosing when you want to be separated from it. Yes, that's a pretty tall order, but it's one that we can do because of the empowerment that we have from our great God. He gives us the ability to be useful. We're going to get, get to that just shortly here. So we definitely need to take heed of 2 Timothy 2.15, as we've already discussed, to be diligent 
to present yourselves approved to God. If you're approved to God, you're a useful vessel. Are you being diligent about that? Are you to the point of exhaustion? Are you giving your life over to God, serving him in any way you possibly can? It's, it's something that we all need to be striving for in our lives as believers. <clears throat> now, verse 21, we'll get back to 2 Timothy 2. We'll get down to the last phrase in verse number 21, in 2 Timothy 2, 21. It says there, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So, when being useful to the master, Paul uses the same exact word in chapter 4, verse 11, when he's speaking of Mark being useful to him in his ministry. So, he's wanting Timothy to be useful to God in the same way. He's wanting him to be of great value to God, just as Mark was of great value to Paul in his ministry. There's a kind of a good litmus test for you to, to, to look at your life and see. Do I feel as though I'm of great value to God, being useful in his service to the master? Questions we all need to ponder. Now let's go over to 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Paul says here, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do not obtain a perishable crown, or no, I'm sorry, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others I myself should become disqualified. That's a hefty passage there. Paul had a great concern of not losing his usefulness to God. He had a great desire to win the prize, to be the best that he could be, for not out of pride, but out of his desire to please his master. He wanted to be the best that he could possibly be. We need to run every race, tackle every task, regardless of how important you may think it is, with a sense of urgency and excellence, with a desire to win the prize. So yeah, when we have a work day here, and we're pulling weeds, give it everything you got. Shoveling dirt, give it everything you got. Cutting the grass, cleaning the church, cleaning the toilets, give it everything you got because who are you doing it for? You're doing it for God. You're not doing it to please yourself or to pat yourself on the back. We are doing it to serve our great and holy God. So we need to have that kind of a strong desire to serve him the best that we possibly can. God does not need or want our half-hearted effort. Uh, if you show up to take care of a task that's been made, you've been made aware of here at the church, and you're doing it with a little bit of grumbling, a little bit of, oh, let me hurry up and get this over with. I got things to do. There's reruns of CSI coming on shortly, and I, I just got to get home. No. That's not the attitude we should have. You should come here smiling, looking forward to serving God, even if it is wiping down a toilet. I, really, that's, that's what it boils down to. What's your attitude like when you're serving God? Um, I've often talked you know, with my class about I have to be cautious with that, especially when we're doing Sunday school with all the different ministry aspects that I'm wrapped up in. I have to be cautious to not let it become a job. Well, I've got to do it. No, I, I want to do it. I should have that desire to want to do it for my Lord and Savior so that I can share whatever talents and gifts he's given me with the other believers of this church and those outside this church. So we need to have the, the correct attitude when we're serving God. It should be our delight to serve him. Um, 
Philippians 2, 13 through 15. Philippians 2, 13 through 15. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Hmm. That can sometimes be a tough one. No complaining? No arguing? Not when you're serving God. Everything that we do for him. No disputing. No complaining. Have the right attitude. Check your pride at the door. You should do that every day. But have the right attitude when you're serving God. Now the word master that we see back in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 21. That word master translate despotes from which we get the word despot so we're not simply rightly related to God when we're saved we wholly belong to God he is our sovereign master our loving and benevolent Lord who actually owns us now 2nd Corinthians you don't have to turn there 2nd Corinthians 620 says for you were bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit so external and internal is how we should glorify God. You can fool a lot of people with the external. What's the internal like? What's your heart saying? That's what's most important. God's not worried about our actions on the outside. If, if inside we're corrupt, that's a problem. God could care less what we're doing on the outside, regardless of how good it might look to man. Well, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Both of them are God's. Everything we do, think, or say should glorify God. Now, the do and the say, it's a little bit easier. The think, ooh. <laughs> Is that a problem for anybody else in here other than me? <laughs> uh, especially when yeah, I do a lot of driving now with my new job. I know Gene understands this. Whew, sometimes the thoughts that go through your mind with the way people drive, then you got to check yourself. No, nope. <laughs> just stop yourself. You know, just deal with it. Let it roll. You know, it's not worth it. Don't get yourself all wired, round, wound up and, and start thinking some evil things or saying some things that you shouldn't. That, that, well, we might have to discuss that later, Rick. <laughs> all right. So, prepared for every good work right at the end of the verse there. Um, so be useful, sanctified, and useful to the master. So set apart by God, useful to him, and prepared for every good work. A vessel for honor is prepared for every good work. The word, uh, it's, I'm, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce it, but hedomazo carries the idea of readiness, willingness, and eagerness. So do you realize the moment you got saved that God placed in us a divine state of preparedness? The moment you got saved, he placed within you a divine state of preparedness. We received the Holy Spirit to indwell us and empower us. That's our divine state of preparedness. So submission is the issue. We also have his word to teach us truth and his will. But unlike the metal or wooden vessels, a human ha vessel has a will. Therefore, our full preparedness for the Lord's work demands more than simply having his spirit and, and possessing talents and gifts that he has provided. It requires more than that. It also demands our genuine and unreserved willingness to submit to his spirit, to use those talents, to use those gifts, and to obey his revealed truth. To go back to the words of that hymn that the, in week one that I quoted a, a, a short phrase to. A truly prepared, prepared Christian can honestly say to be used of God is my desire. The well, question again is, is that your desire, to be used of God? Believers, it's time to stop with the excuses, time to check our priorities, time to wholeheartedly submit ourselves to God's will, to be that honorable vessel and to be useful. To our master. Pastor Bob here.